So we still have half an hour to go. Um, still, so we have time to discuss. We had, we had three presentations, as you had the opportunity to um, listen to, um, three presentations that have taken us directly and deeply uh, into the reality of the next European elections. Uh, we noticed that the perspectives are several. The issues are numerous and some of them are pretty hot. And being scholars, we tend to prefer to prefer um, the scientific approach in studying the European elections. Um, this afternoon, as I announced, and as you can see from the program, there will be a, a, a workshop which is in parallel with other two sessions of the, of the conference. And so for those who can attend this afternoon workshop, um, they, uh, you will uh, be able to follow and to contribute to the discussion on the methodologies um, that uh, are the best to be implemented in uh, starting the campaign of the next European elections. Um, but, but this morning we still have, as I said, 25 minutes to go, so uh, I would ask any of you to uh, come up with some questions or comments on uh, the topics that have been presented by uh, the three speakers. Uh, Philip, you know, about spoke most of the uh, both the sentiments in, in, in Europe, uh, about Europe and about European elections. And uh, Bernd, uh, Bernd uh, uh, what uh, previous research has found and what the future research might find. And, uh, and then, last but not least, Kevin, about the uh, case study on media coverage uh, that contribute to the a comparative effort, even though it's a it's a national, uh, it's focused on, on domestic dynamics. Okay, so we time for discussion. Any comments? Usually, presentation make people speechless. <laughs> that's, that's a problem. <laughs> after a while. Uh, Oh, there is a question from Anastasia Grusia from the University of Moscow University. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know, uh, so sometimes, or maybe very often, uh, like the anti-European Union uh, issues... Wait, wait, Anastasia. Um, you need a microphone. Yeah, you need, yeah, for the sake of uh, recording. Uh, ah, okay. Um, they, 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 I was afraid not uh, they to hear you. Now. They hear you. No, no, it's not about loudness. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sometimes, or maybe very often, uh, some kind of like anti-European Union issues are the issues for the national political campaigns, election campaigns. Um, during this research, after this research, uh, are you going to deal somehow with this problem in my view because when you were speaking about the being favorite or non-favorite towards the European Union or to taking part in the European uh, election so I uh, personally I see it as a problem when these anti-European issues are the issues for the national political campaign so are you going to give some advices for anybody or is it an issue for the research also thank you very much any of you would like to respond? Thank you. Um, no, not necessarily an embarrassing question, but um, the communication about the European Union and also what the European Parliament is doing. Um, cannot, and this is not an, if you want, exculpatory statement, no. they cannot be borne alone by, by the members of the European Parliament or, or by the institution itself. Um, what Ken was saying at the beginning of the, during, during his intervention on, on the second order elections, um, it is 
absolutely valid from the point of view that people do not vote that much because they think their vote doesn't matter. European elections don't matter. I can do whatever I want. My government will not fall. Uh, I will have the same prime minister the day after, will have the same government the day after, nothing happens. So basically I can use European Parliament elections to, if I want support whomever I want to be the opposition, I just give them something to think about or whatever. So there are many, many reasons why, and all of them, most of them, the wrong reasons uh, in, in this corner why, why people would vote in, in, in European elections. But especially also because they do not know why the vote actually would matter. I mean, what happens after it? What the European Parliament, the European Union, indeed does to influence their life. And I think uh, on that one we have a we have a, a shift since the economic or the beginning of a shift, if you want, since the the, the economic and fiscal crisis that we had, uh, 2008, 9, 10, and coming out of that one that people, citizens, realized slowly that actually what is being done in Brussels, or decisions that are taken by the European Union, by the European Parliament, might have an immediate next day, if you want, impact on their own and on their personal lives. Uh, so this is, this, is a, this is a feeling that is, that is growing, that is used partly and more, I would say, by anti-European or Eurosceptical Euro forces, then it is used by the pro-European forces. I can, let's, let's put it like that, uh, from, from the country that I know best, the situation in Austria, uh, we have the permanent issue since we joined in 2004 that uh, everything positive that came out for Austrian citizens was sold back home in Vienna as something that the government did or that the Austrian Parliament did in basically uh, introducing European legislation than in national, in national legislation, or transferring to national legislation. So, uh, whereas everything bad that happened that we would not agree with, and I suppose that you all know that, was the same, was immediately put on, Euro, on, on Europe, on Brussels. So, everything bad that happens is Brussels, everything good that happens was us. Uh, so the connection between uh, we are part of every single decision, we are part of every single step of the process that leads to where we are right now, is something that at least in Austrian politics and political communication is very, very much underrepresented. And there is always the external, or very far too often, the external enemy Brussels with which we have nothing to do, and then it's us which impacts immediately on the European election, because why would, I, why would I have to go to these elections and participate in it, if anyway nothing happens and whatever we say has no impact, uh, whatever I want uh, would have afterwards no impact in those elections. So at the end of the day, what I wanted to say is, um, although I am not too sure from the data that we are having, that we are looking at a massive Eurosceptic wave at the next European elections. We do not. We have an aggregated potential, true, that is putting them, if I put every, if I put all the Eurosceptics and the European parties together, that would put them around the second place in, 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 in influence. But this is a potential that will not realize in, uh, will not realize itself as a political group, as a political force that is actually operational on the one hand. And on the other hand, it also has to be said that 90% of the increases that we are looking at for right-wing groups in the European Parliament after the European elections come from two countries. And that's that. The rest does not necessarily increase. It comes from Germany with the IFD, and it comes, I have to say, it comes from Italy. It comes from the Lega, and it comes there. They're rising by 25 seats, and uh, the Cinque Stelle more or less the same. And this is what is making up 90% of the bulk of the rise of the right wing. There is no wave. That being said, 
it needs to be dealt with, but it cannot be dealt with only by the European Parliament. What is necessary would be, and this is a little bit dreamland, would be a shift also towards national political communication that Europe is something that is a responsibility for all of us, starting from local, regional, national level. But if you leave European communication only to Brussels, then you will never, ever get anywhere at the end of the day. Seen from a, an Italian point of view, I have the impression that next European elections will be very different from all the previous elections. And will be much more important than previous elections. I have this feeling. Uh, first of all, because for the first time, they will affect also the government majority in Italy. Uh, and this will be very important. This is the first point. So important next election. Second point, uh, Kevin, uh, I, I, I've seen a lot of similarity between Ireland and, uh, and Italy. Attention to celebrities, to important persons, uh, that are there just to take votes, and then they don't count anything. I have the impression, again, that next elections will be different. Not so much focus on uh, personalities, but on issues. Again, seen from an Italian point of view, immigration. This will be an important issue for next European election. Of course, the relationship between uh, the country and Europe which does not mean being left or right. I'm not sure that next Eurobarometer has to, has to take into account um, parties on the right, party on the left. Because I'm not sure, for instance, that the issue of uh, EU is uh, the anti, uh, the anti-European attitude is uh, a rightist attitude. I'm not sure that you can say this anymore, at least in Italy. So how would you place a, a, an attitude against uh, uh, Europe, on the right or on the left? The impression is that issues will be much more important in the next election, in the next European election, much more than personalities. And of course, a, a research on next elections has, has to take into account these changes. It's, it's not just Italian in a way, because if you look, it's not, it's not just France either or Germany, but the issue of immigration is a, a general issue. And then I wonder how much next elections will depend on uh, temporary issues. For instance, uh, from the data that Schumacher has shown, we saw that terrorism does not appear so important. Are you sure that you can say this today? No. Not anymore. So, what will come next? This is an issue. Uh, but this is an important issue to be studied in a way. And uh, to, to be followed. The changes in, uh, in the, the title of this round table is uh, 40 years of European elections. What will come next? Probably we don't know. The impression is that next elections will be very different from all the previous elections. And again, seen from an Italian point of view, I think that we will be much more important. And also the turnout can be much more higher than in the previous election. Again, at least in Italy. But I'm sure that, for instance, in France too will be like this. Or in Germany. Again, because there are anti-Europe, pro-Europe attitudes that were not so important in previous elections. Stop here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am in agreement with you in terms of that, I use that phrase in terms of that it might be a more important second order election the next time. Uh, I think in terms of the, the issues that may come through, um, I, we, I think we may see that in turnout and we may see it in terms of uh, where the votes go. Just, just taking the two questions together and I, your point, uh, you understand the phrase, eating bread is soon forgotten? 
Um, I think Europe is very much in that space. I was saying to Eduardo last evening, tomorrow is the, the, the 100th anniversary uh, of when Irish women were first able to vote, cast their ballot, uh, and the first Countess Markovic, the, 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 the first uh, MEP, uh, was, was elected. Uh, so it's the centenary anniversary, a lot of events in, in, in Ireland and the United Kingdom uh, at the moment because of that. Um, but in the 1970s, it took Irish membership of the European Union for the, the role of women in society to be transformed in terms of the workplace, uh, in terms of their, their medical issues and health, uh, in terms of work and pay. Uh, that came because of our European me membership. Uh, but that's gone now. You know, and, um, people don't associate that was one of the positives of European membership. Uh, they look at more contemporary issues. Uh, and I think when we did the, the study of the 2014 uh, European election, I think one of the things that we missed, uh, and it's, a, it's there, but we didn't bring it out strong enough, was the rise of populism, uh, the, the anti-EU sentiment. It's there in terms of even the analysis of Angela Merkel in posters. Um, but I think in terms of, we, we, we really didn't put enough emphasis on what that was going to mean back in national domestic politics post-2014. We were doing this analysis in 2015, 2016. I think that's going to be very much to the fore for the coming elections. And then it does take a huge degree of, I suppose, emphasis in relation to media coverage, um, and public engagement, and not to give the public a free pass. And that's where turnout becomes important. These are, uh, they, they then become more important issues um, so that the European Parliament is governable. Uh, after the, 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 the next set of uh, ballots are counted. So I think it, it probably is likely to be because of the issues in many, from Hungary to Italy to the United Kingdom to Germany, probably the most important set of European Parliament elections uh, since 1979. Okay. Um, I have a question for Philip, if you don't mind. And you spoke of um, the turnout, and you said that the last uh, turnout in the last election was 42.6%. Now, um, it might happen, yes, you know, not the last as a possibility to, you know, to, uh, to tell you exactly how it, it would go. But you are an expert, you know, you sort of, you are close, closer than us to the sentiments of uh, voters in Europe, um, according to the EU barometer. And that. Mm, the question is, do you think that there will be a, a further decrease in, in the turnout, or, and um, this is my feeling, or because of the anti-active, anti-Euro uh, sentiment that has been growing in the last couple of years, at least, uh, all over Europe, there will be a, a more active participation of people that want to show that we are sick and tired of Europe and putting it a bit around what, What's your feeling about it? I'm not too much into divination, so basically... <laughs> <laughs> I have a Yes, 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 a bit, I said a bit, a tiny bit of um, From what we gather in our work in digi-communication in the European Parliament, the interest from the media side on the upcoming elections was never as high as we have it now, half a year, six, seven, eight months before the elections. Uh, this goes throughout all the countries. We have news organizations, TV, radio, media, online, already lining up, asking what are we doing, how can we cooperate. So the interest is there. Um, the interest is there, and this also then ties in with what you said. I mean, media follow partly in how I could also understand it, media follow what is happening. They are picking up on, 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 on trends, on developments, on a feeling in the population, on, on a general sentiment in the population. And one thing is for sure, and I wouldn't reduce this only to the benevolent work of the anti-Europeans here now, uh, over the past years. Uh, the debate about Europe has increased 
in nearly every national public sphere. Europe is a matter of debate because it relates to more or less now every, every part of our life, as I also tried to say before. There is increased debate, there is increased drama also, if you want. Uh, and uh, the dramatization clearly, or polarization, if you want, clearly helps to raise interest and therefore possibly also raise turnout. I would be very much surprised if the turnout declines further in 2019. I'm hoping at least for a leveling out, if not for a slight increase. I would be very happy to see that and I think uh, even if I'm not happy that it's called a second order election, but I can live with your, it's a little bit more important second order election that we are having right now. Uh, if it goes well, then it will show in, in terms of turnout. This I, this I believe yes. And we have, from, from the Eurobarometer data that we are having, the interest figures, the awareness of the date, uh, partly also the propensity to go to vote, is higher than at a comparable point in time in 2013-2014. So we are having already higher response figures now than we had at the last European election. If that can serve as an indicator, then so be it. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Olivier is near from Toulouse. I don't know if it's a question, but uh, I would like to defend the European voters. Uh, <laughs> um, it was pretty clear from your presentation that the same appears in France. Uh, European election is often about lazy politics and, and, and vague campaigning with candidates that do not take the European issues seriously. But the thing is that when Politicians take EU seriously, it turns badly for the EU often. Uh, I mean, if we, if, I don't know what, if it was the case in, in Ireland, but for the, the referendum in 2005 in France, we've had a fierce, intense debate with the outcome that you remember, probably. Uh, but we had also had a turnout of 70% uh, for this referendum. Why for European election it's only 42 uh, person uh, turnout? So, the question is uh, it's not really a question, but when, when EU is taken seriously by politicians uh, with major figures uh, involved in the, the, the debate, that was also the case in, with the Maastricht, uh, with uh, Mitterrand uh, opposing the, 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 the criticizing. European project, then journalists get interested, then people get interested, but then problems uh, occur uh, for, for European projects. I would like to know what are the views uh, of, of the European, well, seen from the European Parliament. I'm, I'm not saying that you are happy with people not going to vote. The thing is that when they, there is a campaign and when people go to vote, uh, uh, then the European project is uh, uh, at stake and, and, and fiercely uh, uh, debated and, and often uh, rejected. Any comment that you, your comment sounds a bit Macronian? Meaning uh, that, uh, well, I know, of course, it's uh, I'm challenging you. <laughs> You said that when politicians take um, take Europe seriously, people eventually, I mean the media, and then people eventually get more interested and more active and participate. Mm -hmm. But what's wrong, according to the narrative, uh, the media narrative, at least, you know, after he was elected, he sort of appeared as uh, the defender, uh, the defensor uh, of uh, the European idea vis-à-vis uh, -vis uh, the other leaders in, in Europe that are against, uh, uh, they are sovereignist and populist, etc. Now, probably he was not taking too seriously Europe. <laughs> the well, what's your feeling about uh, Macron uh, taking seriously or not? 
uh, the idea of Europe and getting uh, the French people more involved. Because that's a bit funny. I mean, uh, so I need you to yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then we will uh, finish our discussion. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm not into divination either. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, true, Macron. Uh, uh, not in a lazy way, uh, said he was a strong defender of Europe. But I don't know what it will uh, give during the next election, because if he and, and the candidate from his party uh, stay on this line, then there will be a uh, major split uh, and, and fiercely politicized over who's uh, uh, pro and anti. European integration as it goes. And, and there would be Macron, maybe one ally party against the rest of the world in, in France. <laughs> uh, so probably more politicized than usual, and maybe more voters interested in, in having a say of, uh, about this type of political position, position from the president. I don't, but I don't know. We, we still don't know which party will present this, we still don't know which candidate will represent them, so it's, uh, we still don't know if the UK will vote, actually. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really unclear. I mean, you have to be really uh, clever to know what this campaign will look like at the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, we are at the end of our morning session and uh, like okay uh, let me thank uh, officially and openly and warmly Philip and uh, Kevin for your uh, presentations uh, which are very useful for us to you know focus and to tune in with the reality of the European Nexus which will be probably second order, but Paolo is, is right. It will be first order in Italy, that's for sure. Because we are, we are waiting to see what happens to the alliance between the, the Five Star Movement and, and the populist of Lega. And the European election will be uh, decisive in that moment. Thank you. Uh, I guess just a few words. I totally agree with the, the opinion of Paolo Mancini. I'm sure that. Uh, uh, the next election campaign, European election campaign could be a, a turning point in the history of the Europe and the history of the election and the election campaign. And also I partially agree with uh, Kevin because maybe it's true that uh, in the, our previous uh, research in uh, 1914 and uh, 2014 we didn't uh, highlight the, uh, the, the, the role of the populism. But uh, I think that we got some uh, very important cues uh, of uh, what was uh, going on. First, that probably the models uh, of the second order campaign, uh, it was ended because we found that uh, there was uh, one issue in uh, every nation. In all the nations there was one issue. That is uh, in favor or against uh, Europe. In the most country was against uh, Europe. So uh, it was a, a, a new model, we could say. Uh, unfortunately not so in favor of Europe, but the problem of Europe was uh, uh, a, a, a transnational items everywhere. The second find, that, the second find was that uh, we discovered that uh, we didn't find that the word Europeans. It was missing, the, the word European. And when a political party doesn't use the word Europeans in their election campaign, Means, means that they don't have uh, this uh, word in their vocabulary. And if you don't have this word in your vocabulary, then you don't have idea uh, of the Europeans. They talk to the French, uh, Germans, Italians, and so on. But Europeans were missing. Um, and uh, another, I suppose, important outcome was that uh, the, the political parties uh, against Europe use, without any coordination among them, the same slogan, the same word. That was the slogan that was in the poster that Ben presented. It was uh, first Swedish, then Europe. First Italy, then Europe. And you could find, we found it, this slogan in all European parties. 
On the other hand, the, the political parties in favor of Europe uh, doesn't have the same slogan, the same idea of Europe. And this, I think, is a, is a, a problem that I'm, not, I'm very interested in to know what is going to happen now. And now, maybe, and finishing, maybe not as a, as a European citizen, but uh, as a, a, a scholar of political communication, I would like to finish quoting the very famous uh, Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong, that looking at the next European election, the situation is horrible, the perspectives are beautiful. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.